Bonokushle, the two of you could wave. Um, we're so glad to, to be together again today. A brief note that this session is being recorded. So we'll invite you to put the name that you would like to have um, and to keep that in mind. If there are particular distractions going on behind you or around you, you may want to, um, to turn off your screen. Um, as Jason mentioned, we have two exciting um, guest speakers today. I'm so glad that um, Isaac and Melissa are with us. I'll introduce them in just a moment. I want to just say briefly that we will hear them speak. And then after their interventions, we'll go into breakout rooms and be able to discuss for a few moments. And then we'll come back and have a large group conversation, OK? So um, without any further preliminaries, I want to introduce you to our speakers today. Melissa Floral Bixler is pastor of Riley Mennonite Church, Raleigh Mennonite Church, excuse me. She serves as the chair of L'Arche, North Carolina and on the steering committee for women in leadership for Mennonite Church USA. And she writes for Sojourners Magazine. Perhaps you read a piece in anticipation of the session. She also writes for Christian Century, The Bias, Anabaptist World, and G's Magazine. Her book, Night by Fire by Night, Finding God in the Pages of the Old Testament was published last year. And her new book about how to have enemies will be available in July of 2021. And our second speaker is Isaac Vijayas. Isaac serves as the pastor of Chapel Hill Mennonite Fellowship and is the president-elect of the North Carolina Council of Churches. He's a columnist for the Christian Century Magazine and Anabaptist World Magazine. The Associated Church Press presented him with their first place award of excellence for theological writing in 2018 and an award of merit in 2019. So you can see that these people are of course eminently qualified to do many, many things. Um, the reason that I've, we invited them here today um, was because of their contributions to help us think about what it means to bear Christian witness amidst some of the challenges and the opportunities that exist today. I have really appreciated their contributions that I've read in these various magazines that I've named and the way that I've seen them providing leadership over the years and particularly in these times. So I thank both of you for making time to be here and I'm now turning it over to you. I look forward to learning from you and having a rich conversation together. So Melissa, would you start us off? Uh, thanks, Jana, uh, for that nice introduction. And um, it's good to see all of you today, uh, especially one of my church people, Debbie, Debbie Bledsoe. So hello to Debbie, uh, who's an AMBS student this year. Lucky, lucky you guys, so, and lucky me. Yeah, I uh, shared a piece um, with Jana that I had written uh, actually in either March or April of 2019, um, a different world than the world that we live in now. And I think it's actually, it, it's helpful every once in a while to look back and see how your work stands up. Um, and uh, this would certainly be an interesting question to think about how much our world has changed uh, from the time I wrote this piece. And that really focused on, um, this question that um, is, has been sort of turning around for me, um, I think in a new way since 2016 and, and the election of Donald Trump, but what is our, what's the relationship between systemic violence and individuals who uphold that violence? Um, and that really coalesced for me around this one individual, um, Robert Alfieri, and that's how this essay starts is, um, Robert Alfieri is my enemy. Um, I thought I'd uh, just position, uh, offer just a minute to sort of position myself around, position us around sort of this question about what writing does for me. And um, just say that I, I come to writing as a way to work out just the questions that I have at the moment. Um, and writing is an invitation for others to participate in those questions. I am not very original or special. So I'm assume that if I'm thinking about some of these things, you might be thinking about them too. And this is sort of a space for us to uh, continue this conversation. Um, so I don't really, I don't think about writing as something that 
uh, necessarily has to sort of stand the test of time. I, I really do hope that someone takes these ideas and has something better to say in a few years. It would be uh, pretty unnerving to live in a world where that didn't take place. Um, so, so this sort of reflecting back, um, looping back again and seeing what's still there for us um, as the new questions come to us, as the new challenges are before us, is sort of the opportunity to be here with you and do that today. Yeah, so I, I wanted to offer this particular piece because I was having these questions about the relationship of, of violence and, and individuals who uphold this violence. Um, and all of this was sort of happening around this incident in our community. Uh, there's a man named Samuel Oliver Bruno who had been living in sanctuary in Durham. Um, I live in Raleigh, a, a few miles away from uh, Durham, North Carolina. And he had basically been tricked into going to this biometrics appointment and leaving sanctuary um, to, to do that. And as soon as he left sanctuary, um, uh, ICE agents don't typically go to uh, places that are sensitive locations, hospitals, schools, churches. So some will have been living in sanctuary for a while. Uh, and he was immediately arrested and brought out to this ICE van in Morrisville, North Carolina. Um, and this van was um, almost immediately surrounded by, by people who'd come to support him. Isaac was one of those people. Um, and then all those people were arrested. Um, but what was really fascinating about this moment um, was the, the reaction from especially the Morrisville Police Department, which was, they would say things like, um, we're so sorry, but we have to do this. Um, I, I don't really believe in this, or I, I'm actually on the side, I, I'm just doing my job, or our hands are tied, the sort of these, the sort of echo that was coming. Um, and shortly after this, uh, uh, we had a, 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 an election that sort of brought in some new sheriffs who all pulled out of the 287G program that, um, that uh, was a program that, voluntary program for cooperation between ICE agents and uh, between local law enforcement. And under that program, Robert Alfieri, who also um, was the one who was charged with arresting Samuel and sort of um, instigating the scheme to pull him out of sanctuary, announced that there would be a new normal in our area of unscheduled raids, ICE raids um, in this region where, where both Isaac and I live. And so, uh, fact, you know, so you go to work in, at a factory and all of a sudden I, uh, this van of ICE agents pulls up or um, you are stopped at a stoplight and, and the sirens go off behind you. And um, so it's just, just living in a state of constant fear. Um, so all of this is sort of, co so this, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think about um, the sort of uh, rising urgency of, of being able to name our enemies um, and, and sort of recognizing that um, one of the challenges of that for me is in my experience in Anabaptism, um, but in the church in general, is that there, it feels like there's a this leap that happens um, to the command, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Um, but I really needed to stay in this space first. Um, and I, I needed to, to get a little bit deeper into that question of enmity, um, to name it, to really, um, because it, it in making that skip to love your enemies, it's sort of like um, there's there's a lot of questions there. What does it mean to love? But what also but also who are your enemies and and how do we name um, who our enemies are? Uh, and I realized that I was actually in in good company um, in in this because the Bible uh, makes a tremendous amount of space for talking about enemies <laughs> and huge swaths of both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament are concerned with this topography of enmity. And so this, these are stories and letters and narratives that create this map that, that spends so much time helping us to understand the landscape uh, for when we get to Jesus' Beatitudes, offering this response of, of the beatified community in response to enmities. Um, so I wanted to, take the in this in this piece that I wrote for sojourners um, to really take some time to to think about just a general outline so things like um, talk a little bit about in that article about how the gospel of Luke actually starts out naming 
the enemies of Jesus day. You know, it's, um, it, it names Herod and it, it names Caesar. It names all of the, um, there's sort no sort of shying away from, from the structural power analysis that's happening in this area. And you need that information in order to understand how and why Jesus progresses on this journey. And then all of that is informed by the Psalms and these Psalms of imprecation of um, calling out to God for justice and, and, and oftentimes for vengeance um, that um, I think that sometimes we see those as sort of separate movements that happening in, in, um, in the Hebrew scriptures versus the new Testament, instead of this sort of, um, that this is like a, like a, almost like a wave, um, that, 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 that is building over time and crashes in Jesus onto the shores, um, of, of creation of, of human life, um, and so I ended up writing a whole book about this, um, but the germ of it is here in this article uh, for Sojourners. And um, for me, what what I what I think this sort of beginning exploration into the sort of much longer exploration of this book was digging into enmity as a difference that maintains superiority through power. Um, and I wanted to shift away from the sense that that enemies are imbued with hatred, that that somehow we have to um, sense this sort of heat from our en our enemies in order for us to be able to um, to recognize them. Um, enmity certainly can look like rage and destruction, but I think we also need to be aware that uh, enemy enemies can wear the guise of paternalizing kindness or institutional bureaucracy or passive acceptance of the world in which we live. And when um, we are looking for sort of um, an emotional reaction, we are um, forgetting that so much of our history is actually um, sources of enmity in the, in the programmatic everyday actions that happen in people um, willing to seed themselves over to the to be the instruments of power for systemic violence. So again, um, our hands are tied. We're very sorry we have to do this. Don't worry, I don't actually believe in this. Um, and to position ourselves rightly before those questions um, is the is the place we have to go first before we can even begin to think about asking um, what does it mean to love our enemies? Yeah, so that's a little bit for me, and I'll turn it over to Isaac. Actually, before Isaac speaks, I want people just to take a moment because I'm sure that was that was a lot. That was that was great. Thank you so much, Melissa. So maybe just take a moment and jot down a couple of your questions and thoughts that then we'll take into the conversation. All right, thanks, Isaac. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, good to be with all of you here. Uh, good to see your faces, your names. Um, thank you for the invitation. Uh, yeah, in a lot of ways, I, I guess what I'm gonna say is just kind of like a, maybe like a perhaps boring footnote to some of what was already shared. Um, forgive me for my particularity here. Um, but yeah, I was gonna talk a little bit about how some of this, I guess, makes sense in uh, my own Mennonite in a Baptist tradition, uh, these conversations about how to think about ourselves in the world and perhaps in relationship to, to enemies that we might make along the way. Um, so yeah, so maybe a little uh, boring history lesson, you all can let me know. But I thought I'd start with the way that uh, the, in, in terms of like Mennonite, the Mennonite tradition, our debts to the Schleitheim Confession. Um, Schleitheim Confession was a document that a bunch of people got together, um, Anabaptists got together in the 16th century and decided like this is who they were gonna be in the world. And one of the things that comes very, 
uh, comes through very clearly in that document that became a unifying document uh, for Anabaptists and then later Mennonites was this sense of being a persecuted minority um, in Europe, in the context of Europe and Switzerland, Germany, and then uh, other communities throughout uh, Central Europe there. Um, and as a persecuted minority, um, they were called to separate themselves from the violence of this world. So people who were inflicting violence upon them, their enemies, you could say, um, that they wouldn't respond in kind, that they would live out the life of Jesus and not uh, return violence for violence. Um, so their posture was one of, one of separation. I mean, throughout the document, it's a call to, um, there's just a few lines. Thus all who follow the devil and the world have no part with those who have been called out of the world unto God. And this, these Anabaptists were the ones called out uh, from this world um, by God. Uh, continues to liken the world to Babylon and Egypt, those Old Testament figures, um, and the church, the Anabaptist church, as the little flock of, the humble little flock <laughs> of Christ, is how they talked about themselves. Um, so yeah, so just in terms of that's how they thought about themselves. And since they didn't resort to violence, um, their only form of punishment of people in their community who would um, be violent or harm one another or whatever it might be was, um, was exclusion, um, excommunication, what's known as the ban. So since you can't really hurt someone, you can't put someone in prison or jail or anything like that, um, the worst you could do to somebody was to kick them out of the community, um, which is still something we, uh, Mennonites practice today in official capacities um, like ordination. Um, recent news about John uh, Rempel's ordination being terminated would be an example of this kind of uh, this kind of punishment. Um, the Schleitheim Confession became significant in the life of U.S. Mennonites um, in the mid 20th century as part of um, Harold Bender's attempt to reform Mennonites here in the United States. Harold Bender was a kind of a, uh, what would you call him? He was the gatekeeper of Mennonite identity for a long time. Um, uh, dean of, president of Goshen College, I think, um, something like that, but much more larger role in all Mennonite institutions. Anyhow, so uh, he kind of revived this sense of 16th century Anabaptism, these voices as being helpful for our lives today or their lives today in uh, mid 20th century Europe or mid 20th century United States. And these voices against like basically um, serving in the military. I mean, that was the issue that he identified as most significant for his people. And he used his voices to say, you know, we can't be conscripted in, in these wars, in uh, World War I, World War II. Um, therefore, we need to be conscientious objectors to those forms of violence. Um, so yeah, so this was a useful document for, for him in, in making violence, conversations about violence, strictly about uh, participation in war, and Mennonites didn't do that. Um, you know, that's an important movement, important, you know, thing, uh, not to go off and kill um, in wars. But there's a lot that was occluded when that became like the central focus of what counts as violence. Um, so we have to look to other places, not as, you know, kind of minoritarian figures within the Mennonite Anabaptist tradition to help reveal kind of like uh, everyday violences that are part of our lives um, that the men in Mennonite institutional power didn't really talk about. So uh, for example, um, um, I mean, I, someone who I think is very significant in thinking about our complicity in global violence was uh, Doris Jansen Longacre. Um, she was kind of awakened through Mennonite Central Committee's work of humanitarian outreach throughout the world and realized that um, we participate in violent economies um, so that are supported by uh, political sovereignties that have their power because of militaries. Um, and we need to take that seriously that, you know, even though I'm not acting um, in a form of violence that I can decide like in an everyday form of way of hurting somebody, that participation in economy and foodways um, uh, hurts people, um, 
you know, so this continues to be significant for us, especially right now in this pandemic, as um, you know, people are harvesting uh, our fruits and vegetables um, and then getting infected um, out in the fields. I grew up in California, so watching all the images of people, uh, migrants harvesting strawberries as they're like being choked by, by the fires, that yeah, was very vivid, vivid to me. Um, and yeah, so uh, Long Acre, uh, Doris kind of made that an important thing for us to care about as Mennonites in terms of institutional um, um, energy. Along those same lines, MCC was important in um, paying attention to way that, you know, violence is not just about war, it's also about violence against women. Um, so MCC in the, um, in the 80s um, started what was called the Committee of Women's Concerns. Um, and it was related to their Peace and Social Concerns Committee. Um, I'm, I'm kind of out of my league in talking about this. I'm sure, I assume Jana probably has much more to say about all these interconnections. But, but just to say that uh, MCC kind of made sure that um, by domestic violence, intimate partner violence, violence against women counted as part of what it meant to be, part of what it meant to be a Mennonite in terms of our peace witness. Um, same sort of thing in terms of race relations in the 70s, um, uh, people, uh, the uh, what's called the Minority Ministries Council emerged. Uh, people like Vincent Harding and others confronted Mennonites on their, um, their culture of their, um, what's to say, their, the comfort with which Mennonites have been able to live um, in this country and benefit from the power of whiteness is actually what the language he used. He talked about the power of whiteness among Mennonites um, in the 1980s, 1960s, sorry, that was 1960s. Anyhow, I think all of that is just a way of talking about how, uh, for me, coming to the question of what it means to think about our peace witness and to be uh, Mennonites um, and a Baptist part of this tradition is to realize that um, violence has a whole lot more to do than just wars. And I mean, that's some of what uh, Melissa already shared, one, one aspect of that in terms of um, the enforcement of borders. Um, I mean, just to say to, to another way to make that hit home, but just to realize that, you know, anyone, all of us, those of us on this call who are uh, citizens of the United States, um, our rights and privileges depend on the violence of ICE, on the violence of border enforcement. There is no such thing as US citizens without um, 500 children being separated from their families, can't find their parents. That was the news that broke yesterday, what ICE has done. So just the thing about this, um, the conversation about uh, enemies and our identity here in the United States has everything to do with the benefits and privileges of citizenship. Considering all of that, this world that we live in, um, I like to talk, I, I'm beginning to, to talk about what it means to be Mennonite is not, to not use the old language of non-resistance or non-violence or those permutations of those words, uh, non-coercion, instead to think about our posture in the world as anti-violence. Um, picking up on this tradition that I laid out here with um, MCC, the Women's Concerns folks, making sure we talk about intimate partner violence. Um, Long Acre, making sure we talk about economies and food ways of violence. Um, Mennonites in Germantown uh, in the 17th century, signing on to their, the, you know, this anti-slavery documents. Um, all these ways of confronting the way that our lives are embedded in these forms of violence and that the only way to be a Christian in them is to be anti-violent, to take an active posture of protesting um, violence that is part of our lives, that infuses our lives, that sustains the comforts of our lives. And to make sure that when we talk about violence that we're talking about, um, yes, things foreign, but also you know, domestic life. Uh, we're talking about things in, this, in our churches and also in the streets, uh, things at home and also in prisons that our posture of anti-violence involves us in a commitment of peace, to peace in all of those different places. And that we're called to vigilance, of vigilance to the abuse of power anywhere. You know, this uh, vigilance against the powers of principalities was a language 
um, that I remember uh, hearing, thinking a lot about. Um, but also, you know, it's a way that, that powers and principalities, yes, I'm, I'm all about like getting rid of those, that's bad. But also just to realize that that kind of language kind of um, abstracts us from um, repressed violences that we'd rather not pay attention to because they're too much a part of our, our lives. So, you know, just the abuse that happens at the hands of the powerful among us um, in, our, in our churches, in our world, in our homes, in the streets. Um, so yeah, so I, I'll stop there, I'm more to say, but uh, that's what I got for us. All right, take again another moment, jot down your thoughts. Thank you so much, Isaac. That was really rich. Um, I suspect that we all have a, this has been very exciting and provocative. And so I'm looking forward to going into breakout rooms now. Um, and I know that you all have questions and comments because you have been sending them in the chat function already. So fantastic. Um, Jason, I think that we have two questions that Isaac and Melissa posed ahead of time that draw a through thread from each of their interventions. So we'll post those in the chat and then we'll be going into breakout rooms where you can um, discuss those questions for seven minutes, Jason, is that what we're doing? Seven minutes, okay. Please introduce yourself. Please respond to one of the questions and then continue around the circle and then if you have a chance, come back to the other and continue the discussion, but we wanna make sure that everyone has a, a chance to, um, to voice a, a response or, and to these questions or to the presentations. And then we'll come back into our um, full group session. When, so Jason's going to send the invitation now, I believe. And when that comes, please accept the invitation so that you can enjoy, you can join your breakout room. All right, so you should be getting your invitation here. Um, I know some people need to leave, uh, so this could be a time to do so if if you're not gonna join the breakout, but um, I'll call you back here um, in, in about seven minutes. Is, that is the story of God's um, redemptive love um, through the people of Israel into, um, and then incorporating Gentiles in the church. Um, and so what does it mean to put yourself into the new order? Um, and that that is not um, a possession that the, that the church has. It is a gift that we receive um, oftentimes from unusual and unexpected places. Uh, and so, um, so the ability to recognize um, that there are um, there are, are ways that we are invited into the new order, um, into the this new sort of uh, social rearrangement and economic upheaval that's happening, um, even in places that are are not necessarily um, in in church spaces. I think is. Um, is, is, is the gift that's waiting for us to be received. And I, I hope we receive it. I just want to highlight one thing before we go on to the other questions that are now coming in quickly. And that is that I think a really helpful, um, more explicit, in some ways, decentering of the church. Um, I think a, a really important contribution of Anabaptist thinking has been to recognize the church as a political agent. That's essential. I think it's also helpful to recognize that in, in these situations and in this movement of what you're calling with Cone, movement towards the new order, we need to look outside of ourselves and to recognize where the spirit is moving, like say in social movements and what are the ways that we um, lend our power to that work of the spirit that is going on outside of ourselves. Um, and that decentering work, I think that's pretty hard work. 
And I think that's a, that's a challenge to us right now. Um, let's carry on with Melissa, a question for you on enemies, and it came in two parts. So I'm going to um, start with it. And if the person who raised this question wants to identify themselves, um, they are welcome to. But this person wrote, we in our group discussed that other Anabaptist backgrounds, so Anabaptist, some people in this, in this conversation have come from Anabaptist backgrounds. And this person says, and this is very much in contrast to my strongly military family. So what do you do or what would I do um, as I realize that, um, or so I'll just read it here. What do you do as you realize your Trump supporting Christian nationalist family and friends are in many ways enemies. And then the second part of the question is, in my case, my parents provide childcare and other forms of support for us, and we have an ongoing relationship. They know where we stand in contrast to them, but we don't discuss it regularly because it would rock the boat of us caring for our children together. So mm -hmm. how do you think about, about these kinds of situations? This is me, by the way, Laura Rhodes. Hi. <laughs> Thanks, Laura, for posing that question. Yeah, that's a really, that's a good and important question. And one, you know, that I, um, there, it does feel like there is this, um, you know, we have both an interesting dynamic in the New Testament between Jesus basically telling us we will become enemies of our kin, right, to, to follow Jesus, that, um, and, uh, it's it's interesting that he immediately moves into um, into how um, he will also call people to lay down their possessions and um, and give up their and give up their money and everybody's shocked right the disciple and this is to the disciple they just ha ah, um, can't believe this um, and and I so I think we we have this this real uh, strand which strain within the New Testament of the the sense of the play, like we become enemies to the people who are unexpected, like um, the, the people who we think that are, we have the most natural allegiances to, people of our same religious group, our family members, and then a new family is created out of, out of the people around us. And so I think oftentimes the question for me is, um, are we doing the work to create the kind of communities and families and support networks so that people can actually um, be joined to people who are doing the work of Christ's liberation? Or are we saying like, oh, actually we need you to become enemies to your families, but we don't really have mutual aid support networks and, we rec and we're not providing you childcare. Like I, for me, it's, those are sort of questions on the, that we have to be asking at the same time. Um, the demand from Jesus is because um, there is a better life out there um, among among the among the family of God, um, uh, the kingdom, as Anna Maria Sassidius calls it. Um, and but but I think that the challenge for the church is: Are we willing to actually step up into the role of um, of being family to one another in the ways that that oftentimes I I I don't always see that. So. That's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Laura. Question for Isaac. Um, this has come from, I'm going to read the question as it's posed here. You can also know that it's coming from different directions. And I would also hear it a fair amount in my peace studies classes. So this reads, Isaac identified the many kinds of violence in which we are complicit. Is there a hierarchy of violence? suggesting where we might focus our resources, time, money, et cetera, and assuming one cannot tackle everything? Oh, you're on mute, Isaac. Uh, thank you. I wasn't able to unmute myself there for a second. Um, yeah, no, that's really, uh, we are finite creatures <laughs> um, and uh, the world is very big. Um, yeah, no, that's a really good question. One, um, I don't know if this is helpful at all. Um, I mean, it, part of me feels like one, one answer is just the answer that Jesus offers with the, um, the parable of the, of the Samaritan who stops and helps the person 
you know, a lot of the people who ignore uh, this person on the side of the road because they have more important things to do. And then um, the Samaritan who decides to, yeah, interrupt his life and intend to healing the person. So it feels like part of it is, you know, what, whatever confronts us today is uh, um, in this next hour is the one is probably the violence we should be uh, paying attention to. I think another image that has been helpful for me at least is from um, Fred Moten. Fred Moten is a, a black studies um, professor, used to be at Duke, now I think is in the UC system in California. But um, he, he talks about how, um, what it means to live our lives. He uses the analogy um, of, the, of the fort. So settler colonialism um, operates by establishing forts. Oh, actually there's like this great map going around. At least I saw it on Facebook the other day, people sharing it about how many like places in the United States, names of towns, cities are called fort, like fort whatever, um, as kind of a remnant of this imagination of what it means for um, uh, European settlers in this context. But anyhow, so the image of the fort is what uh, Fred Moten offers us. And he says, um, the, the colonial, imperial, violent powers of this world impose themselves in our lives like a fort. And the thing about a fort is that uh, forts are always surrounded by people. Um, forts are always under threat of collapsing. It's actually a very precarious life to live, to establish your power as a fort, because you're always worried that the people are gonna rise up and breach the walls. And he offers that as an image for thinking about our lives in that um, the powers of this world present themselves as all encompassing, as impermeable to, um, to our efforts to overthrow them. But it's the case that uh, if people organize themselves and confront the violences, everyday violences in their lives, we will discover that they're all interrelated. Um, when we handle the violence that we see in our own life that confronts us, we will, and we, you know, confront that, we will discover that somehow it's connected to another form of violence, all because of this um, power that is this tiny fort in our lives with a lot of guns, but still just the fort. Thank you. That's, that's a really helpful image. I wonder if to that, we might also think about the, um, the tradition of understanding Anabaptist communities as part of a broader movement so that we don't have to ask ourselves how what am I going to do about all of these kinds of violence but to understand ourselves in relation to and to really cultivate communities that are in cultivate communities and networks of churches and networks of networks um, that are really working on on these different fronts together and to be a part of the knitting of those of those different efforts and of those organizing efforts. Um, I know that's something that has been important for me to, to think about. Um, well, we are at 1.30. We could continue having a really rich conversation, um, but I am so grateful to both of you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Isaac, for coming and um, joining this conversation. We'll look forward to continuing it in the weeks and months ahead um, in different ways. Let's stay in touch. So thank you. Let's, let's everyone give a round of applause to Melissa and Isaac for being here today. Thank you so much. And thank just you for the invitation. And thank you for, yeah, everybody for your conversation here. Just a word about our next session, our next group session together or our next presenter. On November 4th, so the day after elections, we invite you to join Witness Colloquium for a conversation about the elections, the US American political landscape, and how Anabaptism features in the bigger picture of political realities with the father-daughter duo, Drs. Leroy and Melinda Berry. Uh, for many years, as many of you already know, Leroy Berry taught history and political science at Goshen College, and he's also a bilingual general practice lawyer. 
Melinda is, of course, an associate professor of theology and ethics at AMBS, and she will facilitate the conversation. So we are looking forward to that, and we hope you join us for that next time. And with that, we will officially conclude our time together. Thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us and being here. Thank you. Take care. Take care.